Hi all, I'm going to be recording some sessions about our work and um, the vision and the things that I kind of need you to be doing on the ground and um, hopefully hearing more from me will be able to facilitate and support with that. Um, we recently undertook an audit on our self-harm pathway and it's really important that we feedback some of the results. Now, when I have the full paper, I will circulate that to you. But in the meantime, what it showed is that in the first six weeks of contact with our clients, um, we showed a statistically significant improvement um, pretty much across all scales. That was in comparison between stabilisation delivered by the clinical support workers and therapy delivered by the psychotherapist. In fact, what it also showed is that very slightly there was greater significance, greater shift and change in the positive direction in stabilisation. Now, that would make sense because that's precisely what stabilisation is designed to do as an intervention. It's designed to respond to the immediate need and stabilise the whole situation so that a person can then go on to do further processing or, or in-depth work, which it might take into therapy. Both of those interventions, whilst there was this tiny difference between them, were compared to those on the waiting list. Now, on the waiting list, people deteriorated um, and within a six-week period, things had got much worse for people. So we've learned a valuable lesson um, in that direction too. Now, none of this is rocket science. I'm sure it doesn't surprise you in, in any great deal of a way. But what it does show us is that, one, we can't leave people on a waiting list without intervention um, because the risk uh, escalates and um, all, all measures show a, a deterioration. And also that we could be doing things differently at that start, at that early point of intervention, if we know that stabilisation offers um, just as good an implication as psychotherapy, then really we should be making the decision about how we allocate people to waiting lists and to interventions and making some assertive decisions about that and why that is. So it might be that we make some changes over the way that the self-harm and other pathways work in light of this information, but it is important that we hand this information to you. So what I will do at some point when I have greater degree of um, access to the report is I'll record again and send some information over. But we will now be looking at what happens at 12 weeks. Um, have we got people that have been on the wait list for that amount of time? Um, and have we got people who've been in intervention for that amount of time? And what do the results show us at that point? So we'll be asking for that information again at the 12 week marker. Um, but for now, um, that's the information that we have gathered. Um, it's absolutely critical that we now take this through to publication, that we're able to show people what, um, what, we, what we achieve with people um, when, when they're given the right help at the right time and when we measure that so we can see the difference gained. Um, so the next set of questions and next set of measures will be coming your way. But for now, that's an update on, on the audit that happened in the self-harm pathway. We'd like to be able to replicate some of those studies um, and those findings and the data collection strategies that we've used in the self-harm pathway to other pathways, because then we'll be able to quantify uh, the impact that we're having on our clients. But for now, that's an update on the self-harm pathway.